So what do we do? Well, we have to think ahead. We've got to either have some type of uh, store of value, not only monetarily like silver and gold, but store of you know what we really need to survive. Let's say, for example, you are uh, using propane to heat your house or heating oil, whatever. You want to make sure you've got enough or wood or whatever it is. So they wrote it all the way up, pumping it up with the Wall Streets. Now they got a mechanism that they can actually utilize, short the hell out of it. Now the regulators came in and cash it, crash it down to pick a number. And wah, 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 it wasn't our fault. The poor regulators did it. Well, the regulators are all part of the club. You're not in it, or they're in it, but we're not. Absolutely. So that's the Bitcoin sphere is, is controlled mostly by whales, just like the elite banking system is now. There's really very little difference. And then Tether is, is you know, backing, I don't know, I think it's 70%, I forget the number, a large portion of the Bitcoin transaction. Is, is that just another Federal Reserve uh, on the loose? Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back to Risk. I am Lee. And today we have a very special guest, uh, Mr. David Morgan. David, how you been? Lee, I've been busy. I've been doing a lot here in the last uh, several weeks. I mean, I'm pretty busy just on the average day. But since I got involved with uh, going down the rabbit hole on this whole Tether Evergrande uh, crypto space, it's gotten even busier. You know, I, I saw your series. Uh, I think it's it's probably the biggest risk out there that uh, anyone could think of next to the monetary, the obvious monetary risk. So you, you've done some digging. Uh, what, what have you found? Well, as you know, Lee, we did a, you know, I did a series of so far, 11 videos, there'll probably be some more. But uh, I followed this guy, John Perez. He's a, kind of a silver guy and built a relationship with him through LinkedIn, actually. And I, I question everyone and everything. But the more I followed him, the more it made sense. I had a couple of chats with him. And then you know, I started following what he was digging up on, the possibility of the repercussions of uh, Tether if they had a big investment with Evergrande. And the more I looked into it, it looked like it was a probability. So I thought it's now or never. I you know, need to get this out because, you know, what you do with risk is similar to what I do. I mean, the main thing is, you know, and I'm not a big fan of Warren Buffett, I'm much more a fan of Howard Buffett, his father, who's essentially a sound money guy. But I digress. The idea of measuring your risk, you know, don't lose any money, rule number one, rule number two, see rule number one. So you really have to mitigate your risk. And I thought there was far much, too much risk in the crypto space, because basically as Bitcoin goes, so goes everyone else, pretty much. And if there is a risk there, I wanted people to be aware of it. It wasn't like I'm going to tell anyone how to invest. But, you know, like when I evaluate a mining company, a lot of times there's a lot positive there, but the risk is too great because I'll just spit it out. Uh, this is an actual life example, Lee. It was next to uh, a big uh, marijuana situation where the drug cartel basically was like right next door. So it's like, man, everything was really good except that. I'm not getting in. It's too high a risk to invest. <laughs> so that's not an exact analogy, but the idea being the more I dug, the deeper I went, the more concerned I was. And I thought I'd voice it as my opinion. Uh, on the crypto space, and I try to mitigate it. You know, if you're at a profit, consider selling half. You know, that way you're going to be, I can only be half right or half wrong, or you can only be half right and half wrong. Rockets from here, you're still on for the ride. You still got half your investment. <clears throat> if it goes way down from here, you took some something off the table. So that's sort of how I mitigated how I've uh, suggested people consider the current environment. Do you think that this represents a, a substantive systemic risk if Tether <laughs> like it blows up? First, no. Uh, but the more I looked at it and the more I've made connections, I've changed my opinion, more data. Yes. Yeah, I think it is systemic. I mean, if you look at a video I just put on my Twitter or I think on LinkedIn this morning, there's a gentleman that talked about how almost all of the major real estate developers in China are basically in the same boat. And of course, we're hearing stuff and you and I, I won't speak for you, but I can, I know you enough to say, just because we hear it coming from an official source doesn't mean it's the truth. So now we're hearing this stuff that, oh yeah. David, what, are you, what are you talking about, David? Come on. <laughs> so they're playing it down in the official press. 
but that doesn't mean they really have a handle on it. I, so you think it's beyond Evergrande? Yes. And, and substantially so. I, I just wonder what that represents globally in, in terms of uh, capitalization. It, it's got to be a big number. It's huge. I think it really could, could touch everything. I mean, you know, one thing that I've talked about in the past, and this is kind of the bigger, big picture, is, you know, I've referenced it many times, the collapse of complex societies. But, you know, we're already collapsing the problem with most people is they have their own idea from you know the television set or the propaganda press whatever the mockingbird mainstream says is how it's supposed to be they have no conception of reality but all you really have to do to get reality is turn off your television set for about three months and look out the window now you're starting to become in tune with the re with reality my point being is that we have been collapsing it's been the supply chain it's been the foodstuffs and the foodstuffs aren't just because you can't get them transported. It's because there's not as much crop yield as there was. Uh, the energy sector is having problems. Look at uh, how much natural gas problems there are throughout Europe. Uh, even the coal situation with China getting, uh, getting their nose bent out of shape and not bringing in everything they usually do from Australia and causing hardship on their population. So there's a lot of vectors here, Lee, as you well know. And they're all pointing in one direction, and that's D O W N down. We're getting a contraction in the economy, and only thing. And when I say economy, I mean economy. I don't mean the financial markets, which are just puff and fluffery. With, uh, in my opinion, the uh, the cryptos for the most part being part of the puff. The real economy is deteriorating rapidly, and you know if you don't have a, you know, I don't care how many. You know, what your paper profit looks like in a mining stock, I'll pick on myself here for a minute, or in a crypto or in a Tesla stock. If you go to the store and the shelves are half empty or you can't get what you want or it's going to be delayed, that is showing a, a contraction in the economy. I wouldn't say an absolute collapse. I try to choose my words carefully. It is collapsing, which means if you're objective, it's starting to contract. And then it contracts more and more and more. And all of a sudden... You look back a year from now and say, you know what, there used to be, oh, I don't know, make up a number. I don't even have an idea, but 17 corporate restaurants, and now there's seven, you know, that type of thing. Well, you know, I, when I go to the store and I go shopping, the food stores around here are still pretty good, but if I, like, I go to a vitamin shop to get some stuff, vitamins and things, their shelves are bare, and, and you can't get anything, and then, and then you ask them, oh, we haven't had that in a few weeks, and that was never the case. You would always just walk in there and get almost anything you wanted all the time. And I found that in every store. And I'm sure most people watching this have experienced something similar. Yeah, I've got a subscription on a few things, a couple of vitamins and whatever. And now for the last uh, four months or so, it's just we're not, we can't deliver that. We don't have it. Same, same situation. I guess China's catching a cold and the world is catching a fever. I think, yes. And again, I think the main point that really isn't covered often enough in my opinion because i watch a lot and listen a lot read a lot as the energy part of it i mean er energy is the key to everything and again you go back to europe and what's going on in the natural gas market and what they're paying and what they may be paying even in the next few months um, is really detrimental to their well-being I mean, you don't have enough heat to heat your home or your factory or your workplace uh, because one you can't afford it two it is doesn't even it's not available uh, and I know I've been extreme, but you have to think in extremes. You're really going to look at, you know, I digress again, but a forcing function on a wing and determine when it, bend, when it quits bending and it actually breaks. You have to look at the extreme because you don't want it to ever break, right? So it's the same thing here. I don't want anyone to run out of heating oil or natural gas. But you also have to look at what the availability is, what the transportation sector looks like, what the price curve determines, and could you? And the answer is yes. And most people aren't even talking about this. So it's, uh, again, tough times. And I'm, my view is it's going to be tougher in 2022. So how do you think the uh, monetary systems play into this? And, you know, obviously you're a precious metals guy and you're into sound money as, as I am, obviously. Uh, how, how do you think all this plays or ties together? Well, you know, from the mainstream financial press and the political class, it's very easy to tell you what will happen they'll ignore it and they'll put out propaganda and basically they'll increase the universal basic income. They'll give uh, credits, tax credits. They'll give you a voucher. They'll do anything because 
in their view, all you have to do is print money and it makes everything better. It's, you know, a very immature attitude. Like, you know, I mean, if you, your three-year-old scrapes their knee and they're crying, you kiss it and say, that's a boo-boo and it goes away. But it's more like trying to kiss a broken leg. That's not. And this is the attitude that we're all children and we'll just print our way out of it. You can't. We've already proven that throughout history so many times you can't even name it. There's so many currencies that have failed. So, but that's what they will do. So what do we do? Well, we have to think ahead. We've got to either have some type of uh, store of value, not only monetarily like silver and gold, but store of you know what we really need to survive. Let's say, for example, you are uh, using propane to heat your house or heating oil, whatever. You want to make sure you've got enough or wood or whatever it is. And if you can't, you better you know think again. So I, it's more and more self responsibility. The more government controls everything the more you should do the opposite. So the more that they mandate this and do that and say you have to this and, you know, obey, 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 the more you should uh, just use civil disobedience in a nonviolent way to find your own path because that's the only way through. If you go with the herd, you're marching over a cliff. And I mean that almost literally. No, I, I, I believe you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the same mindset I, I avoid going into Manhattan these days because it's pretty much just a bunch of lemmings or zombies walking around with their masks. And uh, David, when you walk down the street, sometimes people will look at you horrified if, you, if you're not wearing a mask. And they will literally move six to ten feet across the sidewalk just to, to avoid you. It's crazy. It's so insane, though, if you use any logic at all. A lot of people, unfortunately, are incapable. So... You know, it's a little milder here in the state and the city I'm in, but there's some of that. I mean, I've been in places uh, undiapered and, you know, they moved to the other side of the aisle. But quick example. So you've got your diaper on and you get to the cash register, right, to pay for your food. There's no way you're six feet away from the cashier, you know. So you have to maintain the social distance from the person that's checking out in front of you and the person that's checking out behind you and all this stuff. When you actually pay for the goods, you're within, you know, probably two or three feet of the person. It's just, there's just no rhyme or reason for it. And then you keep your mask on and, you know, sit down in your restaurant and you take it off. <laughs> yep. Yep. Like, like, like COVID's not going to travel when you're eating. It just knows when to stop. It, it's absurd. And and they recently um, reinstated mask mandates in, in New York. And I've noticed a lot of people are just ignoring it at this point. I mean, there's certainly pockets where people are very obsessive in complying but a lot of people are just ignoring it yeah we're it's pretty free here it depends you know certain areas like you said it's very similar so david i mean we i always talk about risk management on the show uh you know especially from a financial standpoint you've been involved in the markets a very long time I, i'm curious actually what led you down into the precious metal space and how you got started yeah, wow. Uh, I've answered this before. It's um, well, first of all, I was really, you know, coin has changed. I was eleven. I noted it. That didn't really change much, other than just noticing that, you know, silver went to these cupro nickels. But I was really interested in reading. I was a pretty good reader most of my life, and reading that you could actually invest and you know do well by it. I didn't even have the idea, but I was only you know 12, 13 years old, and so I just started learning about it. I just kind of obsessed about money, really. And then um, when I got my degree, I wanted to go into business, but I went into, uh, you know, engineering, which no regrets. But when I was out on the flight line uh, on the B-1 bomber, we we're doing engine runs and one of the test pilots pulled out this financial newsletter, started reading it to the other test pilot. Uh, it was fascinating to me. It was like, you know, the, the alt news, you might say and talking about the economic system. And I'd already learned enough on my own self-study that, you know, these fiat currencies always have a problem. I knew the Federal Reserve was a private corporation. I mean, all the stuff that everyone on the internet takes for granted now is like forbidden knowledge. I mean, most people were brainwashed to think that, you know, the Fed was part of the government and, you know, a lot of misconceptions. So I started reading. So I actually got kind of keyed into that there was this alternative source. Well, in those days, there was no internet, no cell phone. So, you know, I had to get a name and address of snail mail. I started getting involved and 
the more I got involved, the more one thing led to the other. You know how most of us in the financial space and the alt media know each other. You know, I know you, I know Jim, I know a lot of people, Ivan. So I know some Wall Street silver people. Uh, you know, it just branches out from there. So one newsletter writer knows another. So one led to another. And I started going to lectures. And then I got, uh, they used to call them hard money conferences back then. And it just made so much sense to me where we were going. And you know, it's, it's I, astounding to me, David, that so few people actually go down that road who are in the financial sector. I mean, this, this has been a lot of MBAs uh, generated over the past, uh, you know, 30, 40 years as Wall Street has gone like in, into uh, the career to be in finance. And, and so few go down the, the sound money track. Yeah, and I don't really have an answer. I'll give you some feedback since you brought up and they bring up an extremely valid point. You know, some of my contemporaries, you know, when I was getting my master's and, you know, their idea, they, they just blow me off with the statement, usually one or two sentences like, yeah, you're probably right. It's in the long run. It never happened in my lifetime. So I'm going to, you know, use these stupid equations that don't mean crap in finance, right? I mean, some of the finance and calculating interest rates, but you know, a lot of it is just mumbo jumbo BS Ola. It's really irrelevant. But, you know, they try to make economics a science. It's not. It, it, mostly common sense, I would say. Yeah. I would think. Oh, yeah. I mean, Von Mises, if I have the story right, and I may not, I think it was one of his first pupils. He didn't ask him to study anything in economics. He wanted to read a book on logic. Then we start talking to him. No, it makes sense. So, so how do you actually manage your risk? I'm sure you take personal well, positions on trades. You know, right? Yeah, what I do with the Morgan Report is I look at, you know, top tier cash rich unhedged mining companies. And, you know, one thing about mining is kind of corny, but most people, some don't stop and think about it as if, you know, if I'm buying a gold company, the product from company A, B, C, D, E, or F is all the same product. It's not like I've got, you know, Coke and, and Pepsi are pretty much the same, but they taste yeah. different as the Coke Wars and all that, Pepsi Wars, whatever they are. It's truly but, a commodity. Yeah. So so now what I need to do is who's got the best margins? You know, it's really kind of that simple. Well, the best margins in that sector are the financiers. It's the royalty companies that have the best margins because they lock in a price that they buy it at. And then the, the margin varies dependent upon what the market conditions are. But if you're buying silver, like silver wheat, and I know it's now wheat and precious metals, but when it was silver wheat and they had contracts of $5 silver, wouldn't I like to get all of my investors that follow my investment philosophy to be able to buy silver at five bucks an ounce? You bet. Because even if it's at eight, you got a margin, or even if it goes to 12, you got a better margin. So, you know, we loaded up on uh, the royalties in the top tier. So now big money goes into big companies where you've got a solid, uh, base you've got big money you've got institutions you've got the leaders in the field you've got people with all the experience so you know people like to especially in the gold sector they love these penny dreadfuls you know they love that 12 cent stock because it's going to be a bitcoin form right it's going to go from 12 cents to buck 20 to 12 bucks to 120 bucks you know they're going to be the only one on the block the lamborghini and they're going to move out of the neighborhood that does happen but the chances of just going from an idea to a mine is one in four thousand and that one in 4,000 is usually an average mine. It's mine, it's it's economic, but it's not like the best mine on the planet that's gonna, you know, never been discovered before. It's a mine. So to go from what I just talked about, like a Boise Bay, which was diamond fields, those are rare, rare, rare events. You know, I've seen a few, a couple in my life. Not to say you haven't seen several in my life that were promotes that went from 12 to about 20, let's say a 10 bagger, or 20 or 30, 40 bagger, but those were mostly, you know, really good girl results on a big promote with a lot of people, you know, buying into the um, idea that I, you know, it's only going to go higher. And it does. It's very, so very it's rare. Very rare. Yeah. So I, then I go into the mid tier, which are usually near term producers are producing with a lot of exploration potential. So you've mitigated your risk, but you've got a lot of upside. And then I do rank all 100% rank speculation, asymmetric trades. And in those, I tell people, bet a little to win a lot or bet what you can afford to lose. And I teach to add on the way up, if and only if the company starts to meet its mission statement, there's something, a material change that you'd have to file at the SEC to tell everyone in the public that, you know, a material change in the company we were exploring for 
you know, for this asset, for this mineral. And we found this one, like Boise Bay, looking for diamonds and, you know, discovering the, one of the best nickel projects ever. And, and when that happens, then you can do a real evaluation. Not exact, but you've got a much better feel. So at that point, it's either really undervalued or it's over, fair valued or overvalued. Well, it's really undervalued. Then you know that you've got this much gold and it's selling for, oh, I don't know, let's pick up the number, 150 bucks in the ground. And in a hot market, gold sells for one-tenth the price of the ground, so it's worth 180. So you got a bit of a margin. So you might do a modest bet. But let's say it was selling for 12 bucks in the ground and you know it's going to worth 180, even though the stock's already tripled. You can load up on it. Now, you don't want to bet the farm. But you can make some serious money by doing that. And I've done that a few times during my career, you know, writing the Morgan Report. And this is something that most people don't teach. They don't know how to evaluate a company once the material changes come out. Some will just write it up and put a stop on. The best, easiest way is let the market tell you. Just write it up and stop the whole way. Uh, don't get too greedy. On these juniors, I usually just sell half if it doubles. There's lots of ways to do it to mitigate risk, but risk is the key. And that's, again, coming back to the start of our conversation. And thank you. It's all about risk in the crypto world. I think there's too much risk in it right now. There's too many unknowns. And there's more and more information that's proving, you know, the theory that I came out for, not that John introduced me to, that I investigated on my own and brought him back on. I also brought on Cyrus A. Parsa, who's a really big thinker on the whole AI system. And what that means for humanity in the long run and how much China has to do with the artificial intelligence. And, and that fits right into this whole uh, monetary sphere where they want to control monetary units for everybody on the planet. Are there any safe coins out there? Any digital currencies that you... Well, I think there are. I mean, I'm biased because I'm, I was with the load project initially and it's gold and silver back digital. There's a couple more like that. Uh, I do have one crypto, it's called Theta. It's one that uh, Bix Weir introduced me to that has to do with speed over the internet. I think it's a viable thing, but it's again, uh, asymmetric, you know, bet a little to win a lot. I haven't made any money on it yet, uh, but I haven't got a big enough position to hurt me if it goes to zero. If it starts to move up and it gets, you know, a material change, and it's a fact that this thing is going to be replacing uh, you know, streaming videos, for example, and then I might make, you know, might add to my position. You know, I've, I've been pretty honest about my position on uh, all the cryptocurrencies the, the entire time I've been on YouTube, and I just have no faith in it as like digital gold, if you will. Yeah. I think there's some validity to the technology, but I, it's just, there's nothing backing it at all. I mean, it's so different for precious metals in my mindset that I, I just kind of get astounded when people compare the two. Well, I have a different opinion, but again, I am biased. But for example, we had somebody in Australia that, you know, you can't put your gold on a, you know, on the security belt and go through the airport and take it to your new location. They were diving <laughs> out of Australia. They'd had enough. So they digitized it with our system and put it all on, uh, on the blockchain, right? Yeah, but, but, but here's, here's the thing, David. You're, you're, what you're talking about is actually backed by something. Yeah, right. Well, I, am, well, I, I misread what you were feeding me back because ours right. is. Yeah. But, you know, there's friction in the system. Let's face it. It's just like any coin dealer on the Internet or in your hometown. There's a spread. I mean, when you buy silver for X and sell it back three minutes later, you're going to take a loss because mm -hmm. there's a seven or eight or nine percent spread, just like there is at your local coin dealer. But we have to have that. If you don't have that, you better question what the hell you're into. Because we've got servers we've got to pay for. We've got software developers. We're you sure. know, putting on some wallets. We're finally getting this more interconnected, I'll say. Then, you know, we're getting it connected to the system, you might say, the, the crypto system. But yeah, no, it is, Lee. But I mean, the guy would take a loss because he, he put all his gold on there, but he changed jurisdictions and now he physically wants it back, which he gets, right? And yeah, but you know, it was a transport, you know, it was probably cheaper to do it that way. And I'm making this up out of my head. I really don't know the numbers, but probably it was cheaper and less hassle to do it than it would be to get it um, transported by, let's say, one of the main transport services like Loomis or Garda or DH4 or any of these uh, services. So there is some, and, and I look at it as a tool, you know, the whole load thing, again, I'm involved, but. 
I look at it to be a tool in my toolkit of precious metals investments. And one thing I like about it is I can swap between gold and silver when the ratios are really out of whack with very little slippage. I can't do that in, I could do it synthetically with ETFs and that's okay. Uh, but this is to do it in the hard assets. So I could actually swap my silver for gold if the ratio gets down to 30 to one or whatever, I think it's a good swap. Or when it gets up to 80 to one or 100 to one again, I can swap my gold back into silver. So I like that. And there's other features to it too. I had a gentleman in the UK that's having one hell of a time with his bank. And he tried to wire me money for his next year subscription and the bank was just giving him all kinds of hassle. Well, he's on the load uh, system as well as me and said, well, I take, well, why not silver? I'll take it, it's fine. <laughs> Three seconds later, he's done, I'm done, we're both happy. Yeah, I mean, and that's a perfect example of why the technology is so wonderful. But yeah. when we're talking cryptos in general, yeah, that the, the technology is facilitating a transaction in real money. Whereas most cryptos, they're just completely face based. Uh... No, I, I'm not that favorable. I mean, I, you know, if you go back and I get criticized and I can take it. But my right. two bits about Bitcoin, I said, look, who, who cares what I think? Because if I am who I say I am, I'm free market. It's up to you to make the determination. Of course, yeah. But if the market determines it's really the most wonderful thing, watch out. Because the money powers do not want competition. Yeah, but and based, on your work, based on your work recently, I mean, you... You've kind of uncovered that there's a house of cards there that could collapse at any moment, correct? Right, correct. Well, the, the question I was anticipating is, it's a house of cards, correct? Yes. Is it going to be correct? And the answer is, I don't know. So, so we have, so there's the big, bigger question in my mind. If it is corrupt, and there are the white hats, and I think there's some of that, then it'll get regulated. And then if it's all deep state, it will remain unregulated. That's the top view. But then you have to go to the next view. And the next view is, and this is not just my, you know, tinfoil hat. The way things have been for the last decades is the regulators are in the club. Mm -hmm. So they're in the club. And I said in January, February, in my private letter, watch out, Bitcoin's going to the moon. Why? Because Wall Street likes Bitcoin. So now it's going to go like crazy. Well, what happens if it is going to be regulated the way that the club wants it to be? Well, they have to have a mechanism to short it, which is beyond the sophistication of most of your crypto investors that are between 14 and 40. have never really invested in the stock market in their lives. So they're all in, right? They mortgage their house. They're in. I'll bet you half of them don't even know what the term shorting means. <laughs> they don't have an idea. Right. So now they got a big fat ETF that all the uh, big boys can short. So they wrote it all the way up, pumping it up with the Wall Streets. Now they got a mechanism that they can actually utilize, short the hell out of it. Now the regulators came in and cash it, crash it down to pick a number. And wah, 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 it wasn't our fault. The poor regulators did it. Well, the regulators are all part of the club. You're not in it, or they're in it, but we're not. Absolutely. So that's a possibility, and I still don't mind voicing it because uh, you know, there's very many instances of that exact situation or very near that situation will it be true in uh, the crypto space remains to be determined but that would be my that'd be my most likely scenario is that yes it's regulated but how by whom and for whom well you know i know that you look at charts uh, what, what's your read on things now you know your, your view of the charts especially the crypto and precious metals i mean where do you think they're going where they're where do you think they're at well, I think uh, we're in uh, uncharted, <laughs> using a chart <laughs> analogy, we're uncharted. We are at a nexus in fundamentals as well as technicals that the stock market's been sold off by the insiders. And I think it's due for a correction. I think that the cryptos are overvalued. And I think there's going to be a shift in all asset classes, including real estate. Because this collapsing or contracting economy continues, it will be reflected in the financial markets finally. And once the financial markets start to reflect the real economy, they usually exaggerate it. So what's really bad in the economy gets shown as even worse in the financial system. And I think that's where we're headed, Lee. I do think that we'll see uh, more positive uh, price action in the precious metals over the next two to three years. 
I also think we'll see more and more emphasis on the banking structure or the, let's say, banking elites to change the system into what they want, which is a unbacked modern money theory, uh, technocratic system that's centrally controlled. And it may be controlled on a nation state basis at the beginning, but it may go to a global currency system eventually. So I'm very fearful for what they want. Uh, just because they want it doesn't mean it will take place, but there's not a lot of pushback. And, you know, one of the things that is a bit heartbreaking, I don't want to be too emotional here, is the original thought pattern around Bitcoin for a lot of the innocents, really looking at a decentralized way to get back at the man. And really it isn't. I mean, the Bitcoin sphere is, is controlled mostly by whales, just like the elite banking system is now. There's really very little difference. And then Tether is, is you know, backing, I don't know, I think it's 70%, I forget the number, a large portion of the Bitcoin transaction. Is, is that just another Federal Reserve uh, on the loose? with uh, commercial paper tied to Evergrande for maybe 30% of their holdings. You know, it just goes on and on. It's the old adage, the more things change, the more they, they stay the same. Right. You know, it was kind of that moment where people of libertarian uh, thinking had the opportunity to stick it to the bankers and say, we've got our own system. We don't need you anymore. What in the reality is, I don't think you've gotten very far away from them ever. No, especially now that Wall Street's getting involved in it and you know, there's all this talk about regulation. It's going to be less and less that way. Now, juxtapose that to precious metals and, and physical gold and silver. How do you see that or what role do you see those playing in, in the future you're seeing right now? If you ever want something decentralized, that's what it is. Right. I mean, you ever want some anonymity, you don't need a KYC when you buy a silver coin or a gold coin. You know, even in the U.S., I don't know all the jurisdictions. I know in Germany it's different because I've been there several times. But, uh, you know, in North America, you it's total anonymity and totally decentralized. I mean, it, it makes me laugh because, of course, I'm a metals head and, you know, I'm old fashioned and I'm old school and I don't understand Bitcoin. I get that at least seven times a day. Uh, believe me, I probably have a better understanding than most, but I won't go there. So we... Uh, I think it's the key, and I think the way to do it is to vote with your with your currency, you know, no matter what jurisdiction you're in. And the thing is, you, you vote efficiently. You don't need to overvote, you know, so you don't need to load up on all gold and silver and put yourself on a gold standard. You need to understand what's happening and know that you need a little. And it's precious metals for a reason. There's so little of it. So we don't need a lot of votes to people to take their current currency, whether it be the rupee or the ruble or the yuan or you know whatever to move into physical hard money that's good anywhere in the world recognized by most especially as things deteriorate more and more and have something that really is decentralized something that really is uh free of you know free of the prying eyes let's say no yeah, of course i mean you, you could really just go anywhere and have some silver in your pocket and most people will recognize it as having value and you can transact, exchange it for something, you know, just old, old school barter, if you will. Yeah. So David, wh why don't you tell me a little bit about the series where people can find it on, on Bitcoin and Tether? So I do a lot for the public for free. Uh, if you just go to the main website, themorganreport.com, I suggest you get on our free email list. By the way, just a shameless plug, I am increasing the price of the paid version uh, January 1st, 2022. So there's whatever's left in the month, 10 more days or so. You can lock in the old price, $50 a month forever. Once you lock in at 50 and you keep renewing, you can keep it at that price until you, you know, leave or whatever. So there's that. Go to the main site, morganreport.com, hit the blog tab, open the blog tab, and we have, you know, the tiles up there and it will be crypto conspiracy and it will be numbered one, two, three, four, five, all the way to 11. I suggest you start at one. You, we have a graph commons one that we do. It shows uh, MIT and how many of these really big, well-known personalities are from Michigan Institute of Technology, excuse me, Massachusetts Institute of Technology and uh, how they are tied to the Bitcoin world. It's a fascinating look, and it's not something that you know you and I could do in one uh, 
one interview, but uh, if you go through all 11, you will know more about the personality side of Bitcoin than probably most people that are extolling the virtues of the idea that it's going to a million or 10 million or 100 million or whatever it's supposedly going to get to. So it's a better education than watching Michael Saylor talk about it. Yeah, no comment. <laughs> Uh, David, I really appreciate you uh, joining us here today uh, to talk about this. I, I really think this is going to develop into probably the biggest story, financial story of 2022. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree that it could. I really, you know, that's why I had to make that decision because, you know, I know markets pretty well, as you said, and it was kind of that inflection point of sort of now or never. I was feeling the tension in my own brain and gut, like, you know, if I don't start this now and warn people from this point forward, I might be behind the power curve. I want to be ahead of it so people can make up their own damn mind. You know, and I know I'm trusted and I know I'm liked and I know I'm disliked by some. And again, you know, the people that have no argument are you don't understand Bitcoin. <laughs> that is such a lame argument, you know, I mean, really. But anyway, I get that and that's fine. Yeah, I've gotten that many times too in comments. So 